I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm going to grab my phone so I can try to keep track of time. Sometimes I go on a really long time about quilts. So um, I wasn't exactly sure who was going to show up tonight. So I brought two of my quilting books. And if I understand correctly, most of you are either um, fiber artists or fiber fanatics interested in it or practice it. Is that correct? Awesome. OK, so then I'm going to change the whole presentation. Um, no, I was, I was actually going to read from the section about Korea. And uh, I was going to read from the introduction, which I will still read from the introduction. But what I'd really like to do is um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my history of learning about the history of quilts. And then I'd, I'd very much like to ha make this more of a conversation than um, me talking to you, because I'm really interested in hearing what people have to say. I know there's a lot of strong opinions out there in the fiber world, and I've, I, I've run up against quite a few of them. So I'm going to, I brought, I brought the two books I brought with me. I've got this one, um, which is the one that we're really talking mostly about tonight. But I've also got this one, it's called Quilting Art. And in it, I, I profiled um, 20 quilt artists, 20 contemporary quilt artists who do some pretty radical, some of them do some pretty radical stuff like they work with, um, one of them works with um, newspaper obituaries of US troops that sh the juxtaposition is with dental um, x-rays. And so even though technically those aren't quilts because they don't have batting in the center. It does use a quilting technique of layers. Um, so she's included in the book. And I just mentioned that because in this book, we have people who are really, really pushing the envelope of what quilting is. And in this book, there are some contemporary quilters, but there's an awful lot of tradition. Um, but the Korean wrapping cloths technically aren't traditional quilts. Most of them don't have batting, but they use a quilting technique the piecing together. Um, so in that sense, they're kind of like a crossover between the contemporary stuff and the traditional stuff. I'm going to, uh, like I said, bust out the introduction to this book. The history of quilts from around the world is long, rich, vast, and varied. It is also full of mystery. No one knows with absolute certainty when and where the first quilts were made. And although thousands of historic quilts have been preserved, more often than not, the names of their makers and the circumstances under which they toiled have been lost. There are clues suggesting that the earliest quilting techniques date back thousands of years to ancient Egypt. In one example, dated to the 35th century BC, an ivory carving excavated from the Temple of Osiris at Abydos features the figure of a pharaoh enrobed in a quilted garment. Writes Robert Shaw in his book, Quilts, A Living Tradition, this is a statue, quote, of a pharaoh in a mantle with deeply cut diamond patterns, indicating the coat was stitched through several fabric layers. In another example of evidence of ancient applique, also Egyptian and dating back to 1900 BC, was found on a colorful canopy top inside the tomb of Princess Isimkeb. I'm not sure if I said prince, that uh, princess's name correctly. Other findings hint that perhaps quilting was developed at the same time or not long after in Asia. Decorative quilts made of silk in China and dating back as far as 1770, I'm sorry, as far as 770 BC during the Eastern Zhao Dynasty have been discovered. Historically, quilted garments were used for both warmth and as protective armor before the introduction of firearms rendered them useless. And many historians hold that this form of protection was first developed in the Far East. It is also theorized by many that crusaders brought back the concept of quilted armor from the Middle East. Among other hints regarding the early origins of quilting, there exists a quilt, technically a quilted carpet, found near Mongolia, discovered in the tomb of Scythian chieftain, and believed to have been made possibly as early as 100 BC. A quilted shoe made of wool and felt and estimated to have been made sometime between 750 and 860 AD was discovered on the Silk Road. Three of the oldest surviving quilted pieces are wall hangings dating back to 1395, 
known as the story of Tristan. Made in the workshops of Sicilian embroiderers, they comprise a diptych and a single work, each depicting images from the legend of Tristan, who was the pro protagonist of a medieval folk tale that is said to have influenced the tale of King Arthur. Considering the detailed workmanship of these latter pieces, it seems likely that the quilting technique employed to create them had been around and evolved for some time. Perhaps the analogy is overused, and yet it remains most apt. The study of the history of quilts is a process much like quilt making itself. Pieces, layers, and thread, this is how the story comes together. As with quilting bees, where many quilters would come together to complete a project, compiling this history has relied on and continues to rely on many researchers working together, sharing data, documents, and theories as they move toward creating a comprehensive understanding of a long storied and complicated history. For as much documentation that exists, a tremendous amount of research lies ahead as both professional and amateur historians toil to uncover more data. As the process which first gained purchase as a serious academic undertaking in the 20th century moves forward, hypotheses emerge, connections are made, and questions arise. It is possible, for instance, that Welsh quilts, is it possible, for instance, that Welsh quilts influenced Amish quilts? Visual comparisons seem to suggest just this, though so far no concrete evidence has surfaced. I'm, I'm going to stop there with the reading because I myself can only bear to be read to for so long. But I wanted to kind of throw that out there, and now I want to talk about my process. When I got the contract to write this book, here's a little of my personal history with quilt writing. I had, uh, I, was, I was writing for the Dallas Morning News as a freelancer, and the more article ideas you could come up with, the more assignments you would get, and the more likely you were to pay your rent and feed your child. So I was very motivated, and I would ask my friends to please suggest to me ideas for stories. So my friend Sarah, who's a really avid quilter, said, write a story about quilts. And I did just that, and I even included... Um, at my editor, editors can be notorious for changing writer's work, and my editor insisted that in addition to talking about um, quilters making quilts, that I include where busy Dallas women could buy quilts already made. <laughs> and that really turned out well for me because what happened was I got a, an angry uh, note from a uh, friend of mine. Well, she's a friend of mine now. Uh, she's... A, <laughs> She's Belgian, and, um, and not only that, she has a great place in the south of France where she let me stay. See, this really did work out for me, now that I think about it. But she wrote to me, and she said, you know, how dare you include um, store-bought quilts in this article? And I said, well, that's just the way it goes. Anyway, I, I thought I had put the whole thing behind me when my friend Sarah said, okay, well, you should come to the International Quilt Festival with me in Houston. Have any of you been there? You have. So you know what it's like. You walk into this, this, first of all, the convention center is shaped like an enormous ship, which is so ridiculous and silly. But you walk into this big ship, and there are uh, 2,000 quilts hanging up. I mean, it's like this massive museum on one side of the room. On the other side of the room is a market where you can buy every possible thing you can imagine, and then uh, things that you can't imagine. And in the old days, actually the first year I went was the last year that there was some overlap. And this, I'm really going to go off on a tangent here. But, but what happened and what I wrote about in my first quilting book, um, one of the things I wrote about my first quilting book is that there was a quilter who had a quilt hanging in the show. She had purchased a long arm sewing machine from a vendor, an off-brand vendor. Do you know, yeah, you know this story, no. Okay, so um, the first machine she bought from him gave her an electric shock. So she wanted her money back and he wouldn't give it to her, so finally he gave her another machine. It caught on fire. Oh. So tr I'll try to just hit on the bullet points of this story. She sued him, he quickly filed bankruptcy and began hiding his assets so that he, she couldn't get anything in the lawsuit. Um, they run into each other at this quilt festival, not knowing that each other is going to be there. And as the festival is over, he goes up to her quilt and throws a cup of bleach on it. So the story gets weirder. Because the quilt was valued at $6,500, it was a felony. So he did uh, six years in the big house. <laughs> 
I know, and imagine, I mean, it's really not funny to make fun of people in prison, but, you know, imagine people say, well, what are you in for, double murder? What are you in for? I threw bleach on a quilt, right? <laughs> but it gets more interesting. So I'm going to, this is all, this is all by way of me explaining how I came to write about quilts, because actually I'm a terrible quilter. I'm, I'm truly a knitter, but somehow, I'm also, I'm a journalist, right? So, so I find out this story. Well, the guy, uh, while he's in prison, he, he left some of his hidden assets at his girlfriend's house. While he was in prison, she broke up with him. She began dating someone else, and when he found the guy's Harley, he got upset that this woman was ha harboring, you know, the hidden assets of this quilt thug. So to show that he was angry, he urinated in the gas tank of the Harley-Davidson. And I mention that because going all the way back to the quilter who had her quilt ruined, once the Harley was discovered, it became hers in the lawsuit settlement, and she had to really get it fixed up after she they had some engine damage, let's just say. So that is the world of quilts, right? I mean, nobody believes it. Hollis Chatlin, who's a really famous quilter, some of you may know her work, she paints. She uses thread for an extra layer of paint, but if you want to have a lot of fun, go to the quilt festival and stand in front of one of her quilts, and you will hear people, especially people who've never, ever seen an art quilt in their life, just arguing, saying, that's not a quilt, you can't put it on your bed, I can't believe this is winning. She, Hollis wins a whole lot. But she was probably the first one who said to me that quilting is kind of like fishing. If you're not if you don't do it, you have absolutely no idea that, that what's out there. But once you kind of step through the looking glass, and, I, and so I, I stepped through the looking glass when I went into the George Brown Convention Center in Houston, and I saw all these quilts and all these people, and so I wrote my first book, which is a combination of my experience learning about quilts, Interviews with rock stars in the quilting world, like Hollis, like Ricky Timms, who calls himself the caveman quilter. Um, Debbie Sylvester does a lot of portraits of women of color, and she's awesome. She, she talks about how she doesn't care what the rules are. If she wants to use a Sharpie to decorate her quilt, she's going to do that. A and so I love talking to her. I'm trying to think who else is in there. Oh, uh, um, Inga and Steen, you know, Inga, Mardell, and Steen, Hughes, they do a lot of really, they do pictures of nature, like, like they look like photographs, if you've seen them, and I've got some pictures of their stuff in here. So I started to meet all of these people, and I wrote that first book, and it came out, and I said, just as I had said with the Dallas Morning News article, I said, okay, well, now I'm done with this. And then Voyager Press, which is a small press in Minnesota, saw the first book and said, would you write a book about contemporary quilters? And so that led to the, se the second book, where uh, my boyfriend's a photographer, so he went with me, and we went all, all around the country uh, meeting these really interesting quilters, a lot of whom kind of get hassled by the traditional quilters. And, a lot, and some of whom refuse to use the word quilt when describing their stuff because it's really hard for them to get, um, to be taken seriously, to have their stuff hang in galleries uh, and museums. Um, so, so I want to come back around to that, the argument about using the word quilt. But uh, we, had, we had a really great time, and Ori, that's my boyfriend, he said at one point, these quilters had to stay at their house, and they showed us their amazingly trained dog, and they showed us this, their massive studio, and then they took us water skiing. And Ori said, when he got back on the boat, he said, wow, quilting really changed my life. <laughs> and, I, and, it, and it really has changed our life because we keep meeting more and more people. Uh, it's, quilting is everywhere, as I guess probably most of you know, but not everybody knows. So when this book was finished, it was all fun and good, and I said, that's it, I'm done writing about quilting. And then Voyager said, well, we really like that book, would you do this book? And this is kind of where, um, you know we all have a threshold for pain. <laughs> well, this was my threshold for pain. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because when I was, re when I was researching this book, um, do we have any quilt researchers in the room? Any, any historians? Okay, a one, okay. So, um, and my, may I ask, do you, do, do you lecture on quilts at a university, or? No, I, um, I think for the first time, I did uh, Oh, excellent. 
at Lincoln? No, in the Bureau. So I worked at the Massachusetts Bureau, um, which, like, really helped me to understand what was going on. Um, and then I also worked at the Massachusetts Bureau for a You, that's good though, but you've been exposed to that, that, that side of the world, and, and I'm glad because I'm really going to be interested in your feedback. What I, I'd like to say, like some of the main things I found with this, researching this book, first of all, there's an extremely limited number of primary sources for it. So I'd be, you know, humming along, writing notes on, on uh, three by five cards, very always use three by five cards, my computer crashed. Let me just say, I was so glad I had all hard copies. But I, so as I was taking notes, sometimes I'd be reading a book and I would think it was a primary source and it would sound really familiar and I would go look in the bibliography and they would be, you, they would have used one of the only primary sources. What can you do? There's such a limited number of sources. Well, then my concern became if I'm revising what the secondary source wrote to try to present the information, am I going to revise it in a way that it begins to sound like the primary source? Like I did, I did not want to even come close to plagiarizing, but it's really difficult to tell a story that's been, been told and you don't have a lot of information to work with. So that leads me to the next part of it, which is why don't we have a lot of information to work with? Because there just wasn't a lot of information kept. The quilts, not all of them, but many, 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 many quilts that were made were primarily utilitarian. That they had elements of art was just an awesome extra that we got. So let me give you an example of some uh, quilts that are gone now. Do any of you know about the Australian quilts? So Aust Australia began as a prison colony, right? And there was a Quaker woman named Elizabeth. I can't remember her name. Surely her name was Elizabeth. She was a Quaker woman from England. She, she outfitted this ship that had a bunch of women prisoners heading to Australia with everything they needed to make quilt tops. Not even quilted quilts. You don't really need a quilted quilt in Australia for the most part. Well, they, some of them were traded out when they stopped at ports. Some of them did not keep them, the theory being that it was a bad association. Who wants to say, hey, I remember I made this on the prison ship. You know, there was not a lot of motivation to hang on to it. So there's this story of like 1,800 missing quilt tops. I mean, we know they existed. Another thing about quilts, and I use, I, I know that there's an example of, these are some, I'll tell you what those are soon, but for example, the Korean wrapping cloths, utilitarian, eventually the medium is just going to become, it's just going to get destroyed, right? I mean, it's going to crumble at a certain point and become worn out if you use it. In um, Wales, there's a woman named Jen Jones. She moved there. I want to say that she's from the U.S. I can't remember exactly where she's from, but she got to Wales a long enough time ago that she's got the accent. And she would go around and she just began collecting these quilts in Wales that were, had gone out of fashion and people were using them to cover their tractors. <laughs> she, got, she just bought them because she liked them. They were pretty. And suddenly she's got this huge collection. She just opened a museum last July. And she's the, world, she's the leading expert on quilts from that part of the world. Well, guess what? If you look at those quilts and compare them to the Amish, a particular kind of Amish quilt, the similarities are really startling. They don't have the proof yet because, again, there weren't a lot of written documents. So what happens is I sit down to write this book. I don't have a lot of documents to work with. I have a lot of theories. Some of the theories are contested. There's the big... Um, there's a big contested theory about whether or not um, quilts were used as part of the Underground Railroad, so that's a controversy. Um, there were a lot of other controversies. There was a Day of the Dead quilt that um, was made to honor uh, some friends who died of AIDS. I can't think of the guy's name right now who made the quilt. And at that particular time when he made that particular quilt, it was um, an outrage and it couldn't be hung at this particular contest in Kansas. There's another quilting controversy. Do any of you know Sunbonnet Sue? Do you know about the sun? Do you know about Death Comes for Sunbonnet Sue? It's one of my favorite quilting controversies. 
is someone that shows this little character, kind of like think of like Snoopy, right? Snoopy for quilters. And she shows up all the time and she's picking flowers and she's very happy. Well, these cynical quilters in the 70s decided that they would do, they would each do a block featuring someone at Sue suffering from some untimely demise, like being eaten by a snake or, and they made it and they, and they tried to hang it in a show and there, you can read the article. So that's the fun part about some of these primary sources. And the vast majority of them are in the archives at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln where they have Quilt House. Have any been to Quilt House in, in Lincoln? Very neat place. I, I really love Lincoln. And they've just got tons and tons of these articles because Jonathan uh, Holstein, is that his name? Uh, He's the guy that put on the Welsh quilting show here in New York in the 70s that kind of reignited this passion for quilting. You can read his letters, his cue cards, the little jokes that he would make when he got up to give speeches. I mean, it's all there and it's really, really fun. So that, that was the fun part of the research and the primary sources. Here's the difficult part of researching this book. Um, it's a pretty new field quilt being a quilt historian and the way you can become an expert I'll give you another example uh, Patricia uh, why can't I think of her last name she's so delightful she was in the Middle East with her husband I'm sorry she was in Pakistan with her husband and she began finding these quilts that she thought were really beautiful and she began collecting them Raleigh quilts let me see if I can find it uh, page 132 and just by virtue of the fact that she started collecting these and fell in love with them, she became the world's leading expert on these rally quilts. She's so nice. I heard her give her lecture, and she helped me so much with this book. And I actually wound up buying a rally quilt. Um, what's Patricia's last name? I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Hang on a second. Stoddard. She's really, really wonderful. And so these rally quilts, which are so gorgeous, hard to see, but if I'll pass this around during the Q&A. These are all made by hand, uh, and the geometry in them is just amazing. So people like Patricia and Jen Jones, oh, picture time, uh, Jen Jones in Wales, um, trying to think of some other examples. Oh, Catherine Berenson did a, is the world's expert on uh, French quilts, the, the quilts of Marseille. Those white on white quilts with bazillions of stitches in them. So here's the, here's the problem with this, is that I would sometimes run into historians who were not happy that I was doing this book from a very much from a how dare you kind of a, a standpoint, right? Because I came in at as a blank slate journalist who's going to look at this field and gather what I can gather and put it together. And I had, um, overwhelmingly, I had support from quilt experts, but I had a couple of quilt experts, one in particular who was the only expert in her country. This is how limited the field is. And she wrote me a note telling me that I was nothing but a hack and that I, and that, and she was the only person who get, could get me pictures, who could help me with the museum in her country. But somebody told me later, at first I was pretty irritated, but someone pointed out to me later that it's highly likely that she was working on her own book and that a book like this is gonna be a problem for her. And she also has a point, which is um, that she's an expert and I'm not an expert. But that brings me to the next big thing that I learned. I speak fairly regularly to quilt guilds, uh, mostly around Texas. You know, where usually I'll wind up in a church basement and during show and tell we'll have quilt, quilters get up who maybe made a quilt from a kit, who maybe made a quilt from, you know, um, you know, that, that is, that, that's not going to wind up in a quilt history book or a museum. But they made a quilt that's utilitarian. They made it out of love. They're very passionate about quilting. And there's a lot of people who are very passionate about it. My feeling was that um, they didn't know a whole lot about the history side of things. They just didn't know about it because it's not really out there a lot. And then you have the quilt historians, many of whom don't even know how to pick up a needle and use it. Right, but I feel, sometimes I feel like there's a bit of a dismissive attitude about the people who are doing living, breathing quilting today. And it's frustrating to me because first of all, for the quilt history to move forward, it's gonna need support, financial support. It's gonna need 
just word of mouth support. So I feel like the two groups kind of, if I wasn't so exhausted from this book, I could be the bridge between them. But I feel like the two groups really need to come together because they both have a lot to learn from each other. And I was really lucky because for this book, um, Carrie Bresenhan did the introduction. And if any of you, Carrie heads up quilts, which they put on the International Quilt Festival in Houston. And then they twice, uh, I'm sorry, every other year they do a quilt festival in Europe. Carrie may be the best known, um, you know, person to shine a light on quilts. More than, more than, who, who's done more for the world of quilting than single-handedly than anybody else. Which isn't to say that there aren't, aren't other people like Jonathan Holstein and the people who put together Quilt House. But Carrie really understands that. And so when, you, when I interview her, I've interviewed her for a couple of my books, and we talk about the quilt festival, and we talk about, I'll say, well, Carrie, you know, somebody got really upset that a painted quilt won this year. And she'll say, well, I remember when people used to get upset when we would allow machine quilted quilts to be in the show, that things change, that there's a sort of evolution. And then that brings me full circle to part of the evolution and something Debbie and I were talking about earlier. Um, I, I, I also, when I'm studying quilts, I really in part study it through the prism, pri not prison, like that's the guy with the bleach, through the prism of feminism. And what I find really interesting now is that after, um, you know, you, you see the handcrafts come and go in waves, right? So right now we're in a period of really, really a lot of DIY stuff. Etsy going like crazy. People can make stuff. People can sell stuff. There are people who want to be more conscious about, I liked making my own garments or recycling already used garments from the thrift store, right? Just as part of being a better kind of a global citizen. And what's interesting to me, I was saying to Debbie, is that I, sh I grew up in a time when... Um, we had to, and, and some, two of my sisters and friend are here, so they went to the same high school. We had to take home economics, and it wasn't a choice. The boys took shop and uh, auto shop and wood shop, and we had to take it. And I really, and our mom is an excellent seamstress, and I really, really, really ran away from that sort of uh, sewing and knitting and all of that because of, it represented kind of being chained down, like not having choices. So I think it's really funny now that all I want to do is sit at home and knit or look at pictures of quilt. But I also said what a big difference is, is that with my mom had, she was sewing clothes for nine kids, you know, from ends of bolts. I was at Pearl today looking at the yarn and I saw some ends of bolts and it cracked me up because we got, had a lot of ends of bolts. But she was doing it to make ends meet, whereas I was saying I can go out and buy two or three hundred dollars worth of fabric cut it up in little pieces, and then take as much time as I want sewing it back together because I have an empty nest. You know, it's just me and the dogs, and I have all the time in the world. So I think that's, it's another big difference is if we, if we choose to do it versus making it utilitarian. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of these pictures, and then I, I want to hear your thoughts on quilting. So this is a Korean wrapping cloth, and I, I hope you all saw the um, stuff that's out out front when you first came in. This also, and, and another one. And so they're used to wrap anything from food. The ones for food have like tabs on them. You can see to pick it up, see that in the center there. And then I think we're gonna come around to that red and white quilt again. Okay, so a lot of the pictures in this book, I'm very happy to say came from the Joyce Grossman collection. The University of Texas, I live in Austin, so we have the University of Texas. They are, they, acquired a pretty substantial collection of um, quilts and quilt research books. I'm actually thinking about giving them all my quilt research materials. I, I, I'm not sure how organized they are yet with their stuff, and I'm not sure how, how readily accessible they are by the public, but if you ever come to Austin, just look me up, and I can connect you with the Dolph Briscoe History Center. Um, Joyce Grossman had this really massive collection, and she gave it to the University of Texas, and last year, I think it was last year, they had an installation at the Bob Bullock State, Texas State History Museum, and it was just unbelievable. There are a lot of Lone Star quilts, and pretty much everything in the collection is hand quilted, which fascinates me. How many of you hand quilt? 
actually with the sewing through the three layers. I want to I want to ask you about that because I think that I think I'm just kind of questioning the, the mental stability of hand quilting. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I did just I just got a singer featherweight that I'm I, that I like to look at but I don't use very much. Is it going to jump is it going to jump around again? Ah, oh, there we go. See, and I like stuff like this. This to me is really seems like it's pieced together from old pieces of fabric, you know? It's not um Somebody didn't go out and spend $500 buying the fabric to cut up for that, probably. And let's see. There we go again. Okay, so looking at this, I can't even remember if this is a, an Amish or a Welsh quilt, but I'm pretty sure it's Welsh. You can see that, um, but you can see the similarities. You can see the Amish. Oh, and I didn't even tell you, in two of my books, in, I'm sorry, in three of my books, I I got to meet and hang out with some of the quilters of G's Bend. Did any of you get to see the G's Bend installations when they came around? Something I first of all I love the G's Bend quilters. They're very they're really nice. I love that they um, were able to get some things like plumbing, you know, and a bridge uh, where they live. I know there was some controversy over whether or not they were exploited by the guys who discovered their stuff. And I talk about that in this book, too. There were two lawsuits filed. They were quickly settled. Um, the G. Spence quilters I interviewed and the ones that I read about seem to be OK with the fact that it brought so much attention to their community that they now, you know, that's some sustainability for them. But setting aside the controversy, what I love about G. Spence quilts are that they are deceptively simple looking. And I once decided that I was just going to tear through a bunch of fabric and just sew it together, no problem, geometrically. And I failed miserably. I mean, it, w it was way trickier than I realized. And I love how simple they look, but they're, they're more complicated. Um, oh, yeah, so this, was part, this one was in the Bob Bullock. Um, and I like this one because it kind of just makes you dizzy to look at it. Who has a, this was made from a kit. Okay, remember how you could buy houses and kits and have them shipped to your house? That's what I think of when I see this. That's one of my favorite quilts. Um, there are several qu quilt ones in here. Wagon wheel quilt. That's from the Joyce Grossman collection, too, I think. That's a Lone Star quilt. And I'm not sure about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, that's not the one with the mistake. Some There's one in there that's, that's got an, uh, an error in it. And these are the ones from, um, these are the molas, right, from off of uh, Panama. So have any of you seen those? Okay, so in the book, there's a whole, there are several pictures. There's a collector in Houston. Something that I've, I found out a lot of interesting stuff when I was researching. People mistakenly believe that these are like super historic. They've actually only been around for about 100 years. And part of the reason they took off is that there was a group of, um, Peace Corps workers down there who decided that they were going to help the Mola makers um, have a cooperative so they can make it and have something to sell to the tourists. And so you can get, they're pretty readily available. And, the, and in the community, they're actually used for clothing. But these, as you can see, are just, you know, tourist bought, just for kind of freestanding. They're really fun. I can't remember what that quilt is. I can make something up, though. That quilt's been in my family for 500 years. <laughs> yeah, and a Japanese quilt. Well, anyway, so that's, um, that's a little bit about my, um, my research. I'm, I'm definitely not an academic. I'm, I'm very much an accidental uh, quilt person. I love the quilts themselves, and I own quite a few or whatever. Own, that sets in some right. It's like owning a dog. You don't own a dog. I coexist with many quilts at my house. My Raleigh quilt is really uh, a treasure for me. I, I stumbled upon it in a store that sells Indian clothes. They just had this quilt there, and I kept looking at it, and I kept saying, I can't afford this, not in my monthly budget. And then I kept circling it back around again, and I'm really, really, really glad I bought it. So the moral of the story is buy as many quilts as you can. I've got. Another, I've got two quilts, one that's kind of worn out and the other one that I try to take good care of. I do take good care of it. They were given to me. I've got a friend of mine, and just completely as an aside, I'll tell you, he's an um, Olympic gold medal swimmer. He taught me to swim in my late 30s. 
And uh, one day we were hanging out and he said, oh, he said, you like that quilt stuff, don't you? He goes, hang on a second. And he opened his trunk and he had two quilts that his grandmother had made. He goes, just have these. I just keep them in the trunk. And I said, I, you're probably, probably don't want to do that. And he goes, no, no, trust me. I got too much crap. I don't need this stuff. And I said, well, you're going to, if you ever get married one day, you might want to call me and I'll give these back to you. And he never asked for them back. So I have these, um, you know, family heirlooms that belong from somebody else's family. But they came to the right place because I take, I, I take good care of them. So I have some questions for you all, which is, I, first of all, I'm really interested in hearing what kind of textile arts, what your involvement in textile arts is. Another thing I'm interested in hearing is, um, how, what do you think about uh, traditional versus art quilts? I mean, does it work you up into a frenzy? Do you get outraged when you see a contemporary quilt? I know, but some people do. Some people. The the big the smaller book, right? Okay. Read part of it. Uh, oh, and um, it's not that I, I feel passionately that those, some of those things are not quilts, but I saw the exhibit also in England um, last year. At the year. Victoria and Albert? I meant yes. to mention that, yeah. And I look at some of these things that are more sculptural, mm -hmm. and I think I have no objection to somebody calling it a quilt, but it certainly doesn't seem like a quilt to me even if it uses some of the same techniques that a quilter uses. Right. And there were a few things like that. There was a box, and I think... Teapot. There are definitely yes. some sculptures. I'm going to just right. kind of... I'm going to send this out. If you all want to pass it around and take a look at it, you can. Um, so, you know, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned the Victorian Albert thing, because when they were doing... it At the Victorian Albert Museum, they have been preparing this um, installation for a long time. I did not get to go and see it, um, unfortunately. But I can't remember who told me this funny line, but the line was, they were so excited because they were going to do something really radical when they showed those quilts. They were going to put them on beds. <laughs> so I didn't actually, did you, did you say you did see it? I did see it. Were some of them on beds? Yeah, some of them were quilts that were on beds. Isn't that some funny? Some were like in a staged area like this uh -huh. and lit up and it was sort of built up like, I can't even remember, like a series of boxes. And I just, I don't object to it being called a quilt. I'm just not sure what it is that makes it a quilt. I think I think that? when people use that word that they, they, they're talking about the quilted technique. But that brings me back to the word. Now, do, are any of you in the room textile artists who just stay away from the word quilt, who, who purposefully choose not to use it? Nobody? But do you, but is it is the technique you use based some, on quilting? Um, so, some of it, um, yes, some of it would be in the stitching and the layers, but it diverges so much, I think, from from what is, in my definition, quilting that I call it fiber arts, and mm -hmm. then people say, "Oh, what's fiber arts?" You know? Right. You know, and that and that's a hard thing. That's a hard question to answer because it's so big. Quilting people would understand better if I said, "I'm a quilter." And some so in the in I talk about the debate in the introduction to that the book that's being passed around. And one um, Pam, uh, why can't I think of Pam's last name? I can see her stuff. She does the Pam Dora's box. These really cartoony ones. Um, she said she likes using the word quilt when she's going to hang stuff in museums and galleries because just by saying it, it automatically melts people's hearts. Even people who didn't, even people who didn't grow up with quilts. I mean, I didn't grow up with quilts. I don't think, did we grow up? I don't, we didn't have any quilts. But when I think of a quilt, I imagine growing up sitting on a little reading nook wrapped in a quilt and drinking hot chocolate. That never really happened. <laughs> You know, but so she's saying that when she uses that word, it's, it really opens the door for her. And then other people talk about when they use that word, they're immediately going to be dismissed or their work is going to be valued at less because it's just, you know, it's just quilting or it's just women's art or there are a lot of different ways of looking at it. And we didn't really talk too much about the men who do quilting. And Ricky Timms is an example where when I interviewed him and I said, you know, is it all novelty? I didn't say it exactly like that, but I know I've hung out a, a lot with Ricky and I feel comfortable asking him that. And he said, actually, it's like a woman being a, an, being a successful male quilter is like being a successful woman on a construction site. You've got to work like 12 times as hard and you can't mess up.
because you're going to be extra. Instead, so instead of it being about him getting more attention just for being a guy, he, gets, he feels like he got more scrut scrutinized for being a guy. He's really neat. He does some cool retreats. So um, anybody else have any strong feelings about the word quilt or traditional versus contemporary? We have time for both. Yeah, that's. Uh. Um, I favor a more traditional notion of a quilt just because my mother quilted. And there's a quilt that she made that we all still fuss over that she actually made out of bits of fabric left over from clothes she yes, made for us. Yes. Uh -huh. That the backing is an old blanket. So it's the hottest quilt in the universe. If you cover <laughs> with it, you'll never be cold again. So I consider all the other things fiber art, and they're beautiful and wonderful. But unless it can be used, it's not a quilt. Did she, does that quilt, and is that quilt done in a particular pattern? Uh, it's sort of like, it's almost a log cabin, but it's uh -huh. really. And, and who has that quilt now? Oh, we have it. It's lurking in the house somewhere now. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love sleeping under quilts. Like I feel, I ha I got a gift quilt once that was both an art quilt and it was a um, utilitarian quilt. And it's the only reason I don't keep it on the bed all the time is because the dogs will tear it up, and I don't want that to happen. But I, my friend who makes those quilts, very often when he gives them out, people will ask. Um, you know, we'll talk about hanging them on the wall, and he'll say, "Please, don't hang them on the wall. Please use them." You know. I mean, there's a lot going on in the story, but sort of that term comes from there are two sisters who want these family quilts. And one sister wants to hang them on the wall, and the other sister wants to use them. And really, you know, from reading that story, I took it away that a quilt's meant to be used. So you saved those two quilts because you didn't want the guy having them in his trunk and really treating them as everyday objects. Um, but I think it's interesting because I, I have a quilt that, be, that came through my husband's family and I don't use it because it's really fragile. So yes, I, I, do you I, hang it on the wall though? Know, or you? I actually have it folded up in a acid-free container and, it's, and I feel bad because it's actually gorgeous and people, it was a wedding gift. Um, it would be for my husband's uh, grandmother's wedding. And women made it. Uh, there was a quilting bee, and then they all signed their name in um, yarn. So there are all these signatures that don't mean anything to us now because I don't know who these people are. But it's a crazy quilt. It has silks and satins and oh, buttons, nice! But it's starting to fall apart. So I think if we used it, it wouldn't last very long. But it, um, so I'm always torn. Do you stick it on the bed and it'll last another generation or? It's a good question. You know, there's a crazy quilt in, I want to say, I can't even remember which book, probably my first quilt book, where this woman spent years and years making a crazy quilt by hand. And she also lived in a Victorian house. She had the whole lifestyle. She keeps it in a dark room with a sheet over it. I mean, it's, but she can only show it like that. Of the two quilts I rescued from the trunk, I'm going to tell the truth. One of them was older. And 100% cotton, and that quilt, I do leave it on a bed, but in the guest room, just so I can look at it. The other quilt, which is made from a poly blend, and it's a wedding band quilt, I love wedding band quilts. I use that pretty regularly, and I run it through the washer, and it's really showing the wear and tear, so sometimes I feel guilty, sometimes I feel okay about it, but I don't know what to do in a situation like that, because I have a friend who gave me a um, an antique kimono that's made out of this iridescent silk that I'm not I know this sounds hyperbolic but it's true it really changes colors in the light like it turns gold and it's just the most beautiful silk ever and it came in, wrapped in this really special like moth proof paper and I don't when my friend Kim gave it to me and she said I want you to use this every day don't just save it for special occasions but I can't I just cannot bear to go out and get the paper in the driveway in my, you know, 
antique silk kimono. And I don't know what the neighbors would say if I did. <laughs> like, I thought I'm putting on airs. Yeah, I don't know. Do any of you have uh, really old quilts that you just keep locked away? Anybody have? I don't have any old quilts. Um, my, both my grandmothers worked in the garments center and they made clothes. And my mother can't thread a needle. And my sister and I both do needlework, did needlework. And um, I don't have any old quilts, but I have some fabric my father brought back from Japan at the end of World War II. And he had brought back a number of things. And my mother, one of my grandmothers made an obi cloth. She opened it up and made it into a blouse for my mother. So my mother used that. But this one piece of silk with metallic in it, mm -hmm. my mother had wrapped up in tissue paper. And she gave it to me recently. And I have done some research on identifying it. And my mother, when she gave it to me, said, I'll give this to you, but don't cut it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I've used it as a shawl. It's uh -huh. enormous. I mean, I'm like tripping over it. <laughs> and, you know, so I tell my mother I'm not going to cut it up and sew with it. But I don't know what else to do with it because I want to use it somehow. I mean, my father didn't bring it back. So it would be wrapped in paper. It's the hard. This is like such the struggle with um, with textiles. I, I I'm just like such a fan of textiles. I was in Jerusalem this past summer, and I there was you know the, just the old city. It's just all textiles. But when I see it, I'm not one to cover my head much, um, which I kind of got in trouble for. Uh, and I thought, well. I don't, I'm not sure I even want, like the fabric represented, you know, religious political beliefs that I don't necessarily get behind, but it was so beautiful. And so I was kind of like debating, debating, and then I found this one beautiful, beautiful headscarf that had a stain on it. Like I felt like I was rescuing it, you know, plus I got a good deal on it, and I brought it home. But now it's just kind of hanging over a closet because I don't know what to do with it. I mean, I'm just, I'm not going to wear that headscarf. It's, I don't know what to do with it. Maybe we can go out together, you and your shawl, <laughs> me and my babushka, and I don't, I don't know what to do with it. But I, do, but I do just love having fabric around the house. Or for me, so like I said, I popped by Pearl today down in Soho. I didn't, I don't know really a lot of the fabric places up here. I don't come to New York too often. But I do know, they're all in, in, how can that be? Yeah, how can that be? I mean, don't, uh, how many quilters are there up here? Is, is this the entire? So should we open a quilting store? Okay. Oh, you're saying so that even though it's even though there's a limited number of stores, that one store is really big, is what you're one. You all need to come to Houston, huh? Ah, okay, that's right. You can shop online. Um, and so there are a lot of quilt guilds in the city? Uh huh. Really? Wow. And it, Right, so you wind up with a lot. Uh huh. I'm just getting some Lady Gaga quilt pictures in my head. A meat, a meat quilt. <laughs> um, and when you all, when you all get together, I mean, I'm going to guess there's a pretty big cross section of quilting. Is one of those things, you know, like brings a lot of different people together. Is that? And do you do show and tell? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We have the East Street in Manhattan. The Empire Quilting Guild is having a big show in two weeks. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan. And they're going to have a big show in Manhattan.
So. The Empire Quilters Guild is having a big show in two weeks. It's our biannual show, and it's March 25th and 26th, 26th and 27th at FIT. Oh, great. And it's the same weekend as the show at the Armory, which is all red and white quilts. And since that one's free, and ours is $10 a day, if you go to both of them, you will be spending like $5 for each show. You can break it out that way. So ours doesn't really seem that expensive. Um, <laughs> that's a good way. To, that's the kind of math I do to justify shopping. Yeah. And you'll be seeing living artists instead of quilts that belong in somebody's collection. I have some, well, of course, those historical quilts do make good for book, good book writing. No, there's yeah. some stuff in my book about the red and white quilts, too. We have about five more minutes. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I'm, you know, anybody? I say, what, what about the DNA thing? I mean, I had people that went there on my behalf, whatever, who didn't want to go there, but looked at everything and get the book and the whole thing. The thing that I have to say incensed me about that show, uh, what were the contemporary quote unquote quilts in that I thought whoever produced that show and I'm a huge fan of museums and support and all that but I really felt like whoever produced that show really didn't do or the research or negated the current amazing contemporary artists that they have in England it, I just thought it was it was stunning to me the gaps in that show. You're saying that they skip some people or that the people they, they chose? They skip most people who are contemporary, uh -huh. you know, level of Houston, Houston type quilters. The, the contemporary stuff they put in there wouldn't have made it into, you know, Toledo <laughs> times, you know. Oh, well, that reminds me though, there's it's the dairy just, barn that me in Ohio. Because they have such a wealth yeah. of people there who call themselves quilters and I, it incenses me that, and I think it's a lot to do with this, a female art form. That, that that people do feel nervous using the word quilting as if it is less than. Yeah, I don't. I really don't like that part um, at all. And I and I and I guess I, I do want to bring it back all the way around to saying that. I mean, obviously you all are here, so you don't really need this message. But there is this need not only to from this from now forward to keep track of stuff, but there really is a need to go back, I think, and, and trace the history. This book would like barely cover a freshman 101 survey class, like the absolutely most basic information about quilt history, but there's just so much information that has been lost because either the quilts were lost or the people who made the quilts weren't valued. The people weren't valued, I mean. So, the w that's right, women. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's really very sad to me, but I, I do like that it's Places like um, Lincoln, I know I mentioned them already, um, University of Michigan has a really good, they own the Death Comes for Some Bonnet Sioux quilts, it's in their museum. They have a lot of, I think they have a lot of Native American quilts up there. University of Texas, you know, don't tell them I said this, but I think they need to get a little bit more organized. But still, they've got the, ba they have the foundation for what they need to make a really good collection. I don't know, if, uh, um, are there any good collections up here in the city that you know about? Well, Bob, Bob and Artist James are the collectors that... Yes, you know, I was just thinking of them. ...who, who funded and supplied their quilts, funded the building and supplied for Nebraska. Because they used to be up in Florida or somewhere, but that's the couple that stuff. And they have a lot of Oh, I'm sorry. I can't remember how many million dollars in cash and six million dollars in quilts initially. And then they say they have buyers that go out and buy more quilts. I had a drink with uh, with Bob. He's a whippersnapper. He's about 750 years old. And they really, when they come out to this biannual uh, uh, quilting conference that I went to. It's just so trippy. It's like the, this, all these academics from around the world fly in to talk about what they know about quilts, and then Bob and Artist are there. Artist is not as much of a whippersnapper as Bob. She's kind, of, she's very frail, 
Um, but they really make it happen and they really honor them. And we, you get to go into the quilt research room and see, like, don't touch. They took my pen away. They gave me a pencil. I mean, my pen was like in my pocket, but they're very, I know, I know. They taught me on the spot. And you can go, if you sign up to be part of the conference, you can get kind of behind the scenes stuff. It's pretty cool. So do we have any, do we have a last question or, oh, okay, hi. Thank Two you. microphones. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about, um, I guess to add to your point about why quilts are hard to document. Um, I also think, you, you mentioned that the people weren't valued and that kind of thing, but I also think that um, we stumble upon quilts and quilting tradition and studying communities. And then we happen to see that the women in the communities make quilts. So I don't know if it's so much and then as an additional point that people and women aren't valued. It's just we don't know the quilts exist until somebody decides to come along and either work with the community or study the community. And what I'm thinking of at the Schomburg now is a collection of quilts by the Sidi who are an African community in India. And the, the person who documented those quilts happened to be there for another purpose, and then saw that the women make these quilts for utility purposes, and so then decided to study the quilts, and there's some quilts on display there. So it's just another point that, and I happen to be one, I make quilts, I hand make quilts, and I do it, and I want people to use the quilts. My great-grandmother made a quilt, um, they're for use, and I'm okay with them being for use in that, when they fray and they fall apart, you make another. Like we're not um, at a loss <laughs> for um, creative ideas and making quilts for utility. So I just wanted to add that to the points that we've been talking about here, that we can see it a different way. Like I have quilts that have, I've given, given to my cousin and burned in a fire. Like, they're gone, but I can make more, and people who make quilts can make more. And so I'm not saying that they shouldn't be chronicled and documented, but I think alongside that, that we can have um, an idea of impermanence. <laughs> I, the, the Buddhist, <laughs> I, as from the, I like the Buddhist <laughs> angle, because then I don't have to write another history book. I can just work on my, my knitting, right? I, and when I was thinking about that argument, I'm really glad you brought up that point, because what I was thinking I, d I do think it's so important to look back at this, value especially the women in the community, who acknowledge all the work that went into it. But that said, I was thinking, hmm, do we have like, uh, maybe we, maybe these exist and I don't know about it, but like I'm I was trying to think of an equivalent of sort of like the male version. If it were, are the, do we have old tractors left over from or old farming tools, and are they, are, are, is there somebody doing big histories of those and trying to put them in museums and have them at universities, or, or is it just like, well, that was a nice plow, it wore out, and we, we, now we have a different plow. So it's, it's a, I think that's a valid point that you make, too. Although, I just, we do know in history, a lot of times, men got a lot more coverage than women, <laughs> you know, so. Um, okay, well, I think that's that wraps it up for us. Please um, don't forget to take a look out there at the display that's in the other room. And I'm going to be here for a few minutes if you all want to pass that, um, if you all want to look at that contemporary book. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. The, her book will be on sale, so if you're interested in purchasing it, please do so. And I just wanted to add one more point. <laughs> In Korea, the, the, these skills are so rare. So in Korea, they have a governmental system that they wanted to preserve such a skill because there are so little pe people are doing it. So they uh, give a like honor that intangible cultural property. Property sounds funny, but it belongs to the skills and instrument or somebody like her. So they, uh, the labor department protect them. So they give a stipend to you know, keep doing that thing. That's, I'm really glad you brought that up. There was also, there were also times, 
In, um, in England and in Wales, there were also times through history where the government would step in and see um, that the art was being lost and that they would finance programs to try to keep the art going. So it is, that's another, from a cultural aspect, it's pretty cool that to, uh, I like all the DIY stuff that's going on now, you know. So. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, <laughs> thank you. No, I don't mind at all. Thank you. I'm going to. Oh, good. Okay. I'm going to move this stuff.